Love, Hope, and Faith. My name is Heather Murdoch, and I'm just delighted to be with you this morning. And uh, if this is the first time you're tuning into Love, Hope, and Faith, you can catch it here, obviously, on TSPN TV. You can also check out TSPNTV.com if you want to check out the programming and catch it again. And it is shown several, several times throughout the week on TV and then also on YouTube, which you can go to TSPN TV and then type in Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch, and you can find all the programming. The show's been on for about a year maybe a little more off and on, and there's some great shows. I've had some wonderful guests. This show is, is about the hope of Jesus Christ, and uh, this show, the, the, my mission, my purpose for doing this show is to show you clearly through the life stories of people how God works and who God is and how he transforms lives and how he um, can take any, any life and give it meaning and purpose and breathe new life into it, and um, I've experienced that myself. I also have a website, Heather HeatherMurdoch.com, where you can check out my blog. I write about my personal journey of faith and hope, and uh, just very, um, I believe in sharing transparently. I've uh, discovered that um, the more real we are with each other, um, especially as Christians, as believers, the more real we are, um, that we can really give each other hope, that God can, can give us hope through each other's stories. And we, we've got to be real. You know, this world, I think, is suffering from lack of genuineness. This world is suffering, especially our American culture, is suffering from um, superficiality. And um, I'm just, I really want to keep it real and really just share who I am, where I come from. Um, I've shared my testimony many times on this show. Um, as my guests have also shared their testimony. And today I'm going to be talking about the prodigal son. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story, if you've read the Bible. It's one of the most famous, I think actually I read online that it's the most famous story of all time, biblical or non-biblical. And most people have heard it. It's a great illustration of God's love and forgiveness. And I have experienced this personally in my own life. It's one of my favorite stories about how amazing God is. And, and you know, if you've heard this before, I'm sorry, but I'm going to repeat myself that, um, you know, I I come from a background, I've been a believer for about four, uh, a little over four years now, and I came from a background of really not having any God in my life at all, but always seeking, always searching for meaning, always searching for purpose. Um, I had a lot of struggle in my life. I came from dysfunctional uh, background, childhood, um, pretty much thought I was on my own in life uh, in terms of on my own meaning that you know the only way I was going to be happy is if I could find something to make me happy um, I didn't realize that what I was really looking for is, is God is Jesus and uh, once I found him he dramatically changed my life and what I realized is that God's been there all along he's been guiding my life all along it's like I mean he's been pursuing me and he's been pursuing you as well and all he asks is that we um, open ourselves up to him and uh, have a relationship with him and that relationship will set you free and uh, Jesus this will set you free. And um, I don't know if you can imagine a good analogy I could use for my own life example is if you have a, imagine uh, a dark room, okay, uh, no light on at all. And then you flip on the light switch and all the darkness flees. No more darkness. And that's kind of what I've experienced in my own life when I allowed God into the deepest parts of my heart, um, into the places where there was pain and sorrow and suffering and um, depression and different things I dealt with. When I turned on that light, when I let God in, it's like the, the darkness just fled and um, was chased out by the light. And I still struggle. I don't want anyone to think that being a believer means that your life is perfect or that you have no struggle, because trust me, I still have struggle every day. Every day I have to call on the power of God to help me get through different situations, whether it be at home, at work, um, just in life in general. Life is hard, but when you have Jesus in your life, there is um, hope. There is hope in your circumstances. There is hope in um, whatever you're going through that he will get you through it. It may not be in the way that you think you should get through it, but he will get you through it. And I promise you, it will be more than you can ask or imagine when you allow him to really um, control your life and I hate to use the word control but most people can relate to that word but when you really give your life to him and allow him to work through through you and in you I promise you your life will never be the same it's just amazing the joy and the freedom and the peace that can be found through having that relationship with Jesus and many of us search for that many of us are searching I mean if you look you know I believe that you know the the media and all the things that we 
that we see in our society of people pursuing money and, and, um, and status and uh, sex, drugs and rock and roll, all those things that people pursue, they're really looking for something to fulfill them. And um, I have found that the very things I pursued in my life, the very things I pursued that I thought I was going to find the most pleasure in, actually became the source of my biggest pain. Um, you know, I've shared in, my, in past episodes that I struggled for almost 20 years with an eating disorder that, um, that I had when I was 18 years old. And I got that disorder as a result of trying to be perfect and trying to control my circumstances and, and trying to be loved. I didn't believe I was worthy of love. And um, that can manifest in lots of different ways. And for me, it manifested in an eating disorder and perfectionism and striving and um, escapism and all those things, all those isms that really didn't bring me I was chasing 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 those things but it never brought me contentment and the more I chased after those things the more I chased after that perfection the more I chased after love in the wrong places the more empty I felt and it wasn't until I found Jesus as I said before that I really found that meaning and that purpose and that wholeness the wholeness that we all crave. I believe that each of us has a God-shaped hole in our heart that can only be filled with His love. And His love is perfect. And His love is, is uh, never failing. And His love, is, um, his love will, never, will never let you down. And it's constant. And it always has been and always will be. And I think that the story of the prodigal son is an amazing um, example of God's love. Um, because, uh, like I said, any of the, the pursuits other than Jesus, only bring us pain in the end. And um, I'm going to read the prodigal son to you now. I'm actually going to read scripture today. And uh, I want to read the story, and then I'm going to kind of take it apart and unpack it and apply it to our own life. So um, I'm really excited about this today. So the prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son is actually in Luke 15, 11 through 32. And I'm just going to go ahead and start reading this. The parable of the lost son. And it says, Jesus continued, and I should say that this is an analogy of it's a father and two sons, but the father is really God in the story. It's a parable. So um, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I have been there. <laughs> After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole in that there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So here he is, you know, in Jewish uh, culture back then, it was unheard of for the father to give the inheritance to the sons, any of the sons, before he passed away. So here he was, honor, his son says, let me have my inheritance. I want to go and live wild. I want to go party. And so the son says, okay, here's your inheritance. And then there's a famine in the country, and he began to be in need because he blew all the money. Um, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. So now here he is, once wild and fancy free, footloose, uh, living high on the hog, um, squandering, you know, women, <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll, as I mentioned earlier, and now he spent it all, and there's a famine, and now he's in need, and now he has to go get a job of feeding pigs. And in that culture, feeding pigs would have been the absolute failure, would have been an absolutely unspeakable situation to be in. He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So in other words, he was d reduced to eating pig food, the food that the pigs were eating. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. So he's realizing that even the men who work for his father, they have food. They're earning money. And here he is, his father's son, with nothing. Penniless and uh, destitute. When he came to his senses, he s I already read that part. Um, I'm sorry. I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. So here now he wants to come home, tail tucked between his legs, and he wants to come home and um, see if his father will forgive him, although in his mind he does not deserve forgiveness. But he's, he's desperate. I've been there in my life. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Did you see that? He said he ran to his son. His, his father saw him coming from a long way off and not just waited for him to return, but he ran to him so excited and thrilled that his son would return to him. And he threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattest calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate my son's return. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And I'm going to talk about this later, but um, it's just so amazing, the love of this father for a son that no matter where his father went, I mean, I'm sorry, that no matter where his son went, no matter how far gone his father um, thought his son was, and no matter how far gone the son actually was, the father loved him and embraced him and celebrated his return. The love of the father is just so amazing. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Remember, there's two brothers. So meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he hears the celebration. And uh, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. And when we return, we're going to talk more about that, um, the older brother. And do stay tuned. I want to finish the story. We'll, we'll be right back. You're watching your local television network, TSPN, and now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Back to Love, Hope, and Faith. My name is Heather Murdoch, and um, I'm today reading and talking about the parable of the prodigal son, which is a very well-loved uh, story, and even with believers and non-believers alike, um, it's a story of a father's love for his sons. And um, I was talking about the younger son who went off and squandered his father's wealth, his inheritance, and had to come back with his tail between his legs, penniless and desperate for um, forgiveness from his father, and how his father threw a party for him and celebrated and gave him his best, uh, killed their best um, fatted calf and, and, and uh, the best robe and sandals on his feet and celebrated and had a huge party in celebration of his son's return. And now we're talking about the older son, the one who was responsible and stayed at the father's house and worked and did the right thing. And this is his reaction to the story. So now this is Luke 15, um, 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And I just love that story. I, have you ever felt that way? Have you, which, which brother can you relate to? Can you relate to the brother that, um, that shamed his family and you feel like maybe you're too far gone for God to ever love you or forgive you? Or can you relate to the other son who um, did everything right? The one son who, who feels uh, slighted because he feels like he did everything right and he doesn't get the rewards. And maybe you, maybe you feel resentful that, um, that you're not getting what you feel you earned. And that's one of the things I want to talk about 
talk about today is that um, God's love is not based on our performance. And I think both of those brothers had a misconception about their father's love, God's love. They felt that um, the first brother, the, the, the younger brother who, was, who shamed the family, he thought that he was too far gone for God's love because his performance was poor. He did not perform according to standard in his mind and according to the culture and the society. So he thought his performance was, um, was too poor to receive God's love or forgiveness. On the other hand, the older brother, he felt like his performance was so good that he should naturally earn it, that he was the good one, and that his love um, and, the, and the favor of the father should be based on, on that alone. And um, those are both misconceptions because God's love is not based on, on our performance. <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> I just thank, thank you, Jesus, for that because um, I know that I don't always measure up. Every day I strive to um, be in God's will. Every day I strive to do the right things, to obey Him, to allow Him to lead my life. But I falter, I stumble, and I'm sure you do as well. None of us are perfect. But I think God, what God wants from us is for our aim to be perfect. He knows our hearts, and He knows, um, he knows what motivates us. Only God knows the hearts of men and women, and He knows what motivates us. And so if we, um, you know, if, if we come to Him with our heart, um, desire to be with him and to allow him to lead our lives. He knows that and he loves that about us. He doesn't look to our performance because he knows that we're sinners. We're Humans are sinners and he knows that we, um, we can't always measure up. We're not God. He is. We need to realize that there's only one God and that's him and we're not it. <laughs> and, um, and if we can um, really understand that God's goodness is not based on us, it's based on Him. He loves us just as we are. We don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. We don't have to get cleaned up before we come to Him. He does the cleaning. He does the purifying. He does the loving. All we need to do is come to Him, open hands, and just receive His amazing love, His amazing grace. And I think that's one of the areas that the brothers both missed the mark, is that they felt that it was based on their performance. You know, as someone, I shared with you my story earlier, a little bit about my story of being someone who always thought I had to be perfect. And I know now that I don't have to be perfect. And, um, but I think perfectionism is a real thing that a lot of people relate to and a lot of people strive for. They feel like they have to earn uh, the approval of the people around them. And, um, and I was caught in that trap. I believed that in order to be happy, I had to earn other people's approval. I was constantly worrying about what other people thought of me. I was constantly worrying about whether I was measuring up. I was constantly striving to be perfect so that um, people would think well of me and think highly of me. And it's such, there's such a freedom that now, I, sometimes I do care what people think, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I do still get caught up in that. But for the most part, I really have been set free from that. And I thank God for that because I really, um, it's a really a prison when you feel like you have to live up to other people's expectations because we never really can live up to someone else's expectations. And no one can, and really other people can't live up to ours. And if we put our hope in other people, we're always going to be disappointed. If we always put our hope in other people, we're always going to feel let down because people have their own lives. They have their own issues. They have their own failings, their own insecurities, their own life to live. And so if we try to put our hope in that, we're always going to be disappointed. And um, so that's, that's one thing I've learned is that um, I don't have to earn anything. I just have to be in God's love and um, put my hope in Him. And one of the ways that I've managed to do that and that I manage to do that every day is by being in God's Word. And I don't know if you read the Bible very often or if you've ever read the Bible. Or maybe you're someone who reads the Bible on a daily basis. But it can be daunting. The Bible can be confusing. There's a lot of parts of the Bible that don't seem to make sense. Really, honestly, I felt the same way. But I've also found that the more I seek God, the more I seek Him through His Word, the more power I have to live out His Word. There is real power in this book. And um, the more I read it, the more I understand it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, He speaks to me through His Word. And I, just, I don't just go to the Word to have God help me. I go to the Word to learn about His nature to learn about his character, to learn who God is. Because it's not just about what God can do for me or can do for you. I want to live for God because he's God, and he made me, and he made you. It's not just about what God can do for me. I think that sometimes we just go to God when we need him. You know, we don't, really like, we don't realize how much we need God until God is all we have. 
I bet you can relate to that. But God is more than that, what, we, what he can do for us. God is God. He deserves our praise. He's worthy of our, um, I, our, idol, I, our idolatry to idolize God because he made us. I mean, he made each and every one of us for a specific purpose, for specific jobs, for specific ministry, for a specific purpose. Don't you want to know what that is? You know, I used to ha I used to be a person who was driven to know what my life's purpose was. I wanted to have my plan. I wanted to know exactly what, how I was going to turn out. I was driven to have goals. I'm just so happy to say that I don't really feel that way anymore. I, honestly, I don't. I am just so excited every day to wake up and discover what God has for me on this day. I don't have to plan and control and have everything, um, you know, planned out to the nth degree. I don't have to be that um, frenzied planner in control of everything. I can just relax knowing that God's in control, and as long as I am practicing following his will today, that tomorrow will be okay. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own without me adding to it. Just be in his presence today. This is the day that he has made, and to rejoice and be glad in that because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Today is not guaranteed. I can just be in the moment with God today and just receiving his love and loving others as he has called me to love others, as he has called you to love others. And we can't always love people. It's hard sometimes to love people. Trust me, I know. There's some people in my life that I find hard to love, I'm sorry to say, but through um, obedience to God, I can learn to love them. He can love them through me. And that's really what it's all about. And um, I love the story. There's so many different elements to, to take apart. But that first part for me was the, was the performance that both brothers mistakenly thought was part of God's character or their father's character. But I also love the, the part about the younger brother. Obviously, that's a story I think that many of us can relate to. And that story is that, um, that he thought he could do it on his own. He's like, Dad, I don't need you. Just give me the money. I'm going to make my own life. I want to go have fun. I want to go experience life. I want to live on the edge. Um, I want to do things on my own terms. I want to, um, I want to be happy. I want to live in the moment. <laughs> you know, all those things I think we can all relate to. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you just want to just be happy and just feel good and just live life on your terms? I think, like I said, that many of us can relate to that. And again, like I said in the beginning, the very things that um, I pursued as pleasure really ended up giving me the most pain in the long run. Maybe I thought I was having fun in the moment, but at the end of the day, I felt pretty empty inside. You know, I lived in L.A., I lived in New York, I was pursuing an acting and modeling career back 20 plus years ago. And sure, I thought I was having a good time, but really as each day wore on, I'd lay in bed at night and I'd think, am I really having fun? What's this all about? What's my purpose? My life feels so empty. And as a result of that emptiness, I would just continue pursuing meaning in other people, in other situations. Every day was this escalating snowball of meaninglessness as I pursued the wrong things. And um, as I sinned, you know, sin is like a word that a lot of people don't want to hear. It's like a bad word, sin. It sounds so judgmental. But really, sin really is a separation from God and, and His will for our lives. And so that's really the, sim the simplest way to define that. And... Um, I can relate to that little brother, the younger son, because that's how he was living, and I was living that way too. And I remember feeling like, I'm too far gone. I'm too far gone. I've made too many mistakes. I have too many regrets. There's too many people I've hurt. Um, there's no way that I could ever be justified. There's no way that I could ever be really lovable. I had that shame in my heart and guilt that I carried with me for the majority of my life. I, I learned to take on shame and guilt at a young age. Um, I think we all play roles in our families and, and dysfunctional families especially. And my role I took on at an early age was the people pleaser, the fixer. So when I couldn't fix people or please people, I would feel ashamed and guilty. And that became just a part of my personality. And so I took that shame and guilt and I decided that I was just too unlovable for God and the more I felt unlovable the further I went away from God and so I really relate to that brother and maybe you do as well but I'm here to tell you that you're never too far gone no matter where you've been there's hope and that hope is in Jesus and his love endures forever and they're not too far gone he loves you right where you are come to him let him show you that love it's so amazing it's so freeing and it's so there's so much joy and contentment in that and we're going to come back we're going to talk more about the older brother because I can relate to him as well and I hope you're enjoying today's show. Come back in about three minutes and we'll talk more.
You're watching your local television network, TSPN. And now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Welcome back to Love, Hope, and Faith, and we're discussing uh, the prodigal son today and uh, kind of taking it apart and what the story really means and how we can apply that to our own life and really to understand more fully the nature of God and His amazing grace and His amazing love. And um, I want to focus, I was saying before we went to break that we were going to focus on the, on the older brother now, but I first want to focus back on the love of the Father and just how, you know, we talk about uh, being lavished with God's grace and just bathing in His grace. I've used that term myself to just lavish in it and it's just so he just pours it all over us um, that grace and that love that he has for us and it's not based on what we've done it's based on who he is but I want to talk about that it's illustrated really well in the story because the father it says while he was while the son was still a long way off the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him so I want you to really think about that that God has compassion for you you know, a lot of times God is viewed as this judgmental father, this father that punishes us and, and um, is disappointed with us and has that heavy hand of correction. And yes, there is absolutely God's correction. And I actually have asked, asked him in my life to correct me because I want to I grow. And, and, and discipline and correction is how we grow. However, along with that, though, is this amazing compassion. God has compassion for you. He loves you so much. And um, there's a scripture, I think it's in Romans, that says, while we were still sinning, Jesus Christ died for our sins. So, he, while we are still sinning, that shows you right there that we don't have to get cleaned up and earn his love. We don't have to get all pretty and perfect and, and, and righteous. We allow him to make us righteous, and we don't have to get cleaned up. He, while we are still sinning as sinners, he died for our sins. It's so comforting. I love that scripture. And um, so, when the father, he didn't just go, okay, well, here's my son, I have compassion for him, I'll forgive him. No, that was not God's love. God's love, the father's love, was so great that he ran to the son. He ran to the son, he threw his arms around him, he embraced him, he kissed him, and he threw a party. Back in that culture, getting the fattest calf, the fattest calf was like the prized possession, right? He got the fattened calf and threw a huge party for his son. And... um the, the son, even in that grace, have you ever felt this way, that you experience the love of God and God's grace and you still feel unworthy? You're like, God, I don't deserve this. I don't even deserve your forgiveness. I felt that way before. I felt like there's, I've just done too many things that are not, I don't, I don't deserve this, God. You're right, we don't deserve it. But it's not based on that. It's based on him and who he is and his amazing love. So the father says to the servants, quick, bring in the best robe. So imagine this beautiful purple velvet robe placed around his son's shoulders and uh, put a ring on his finger. That's, again, the father is now bestowing his, his jewels and his, his comforts around the son. And he says blessings around the son. And he says, um, put sandals on his feet. Because you can imagine the son had a very long journey and had nothing. He probably had no shoes. And so the son, the father puts shoes on his feet and, um, and says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and a celebration. So God's love is not puny. God's love is not just like, okay, well, I'll forgive you. Come on back. He's like just embracing us. He's just like full of love for us. He is heaven. The heavens are celebrating when we return to him. And returning home, that's also a great analogy for repentance. And many times the word repent, you know, it's a word like sin. You're like repent, people don't like that word. But repentance merely means coming home because if, sep if sin is separation from God, then repentance is coming home from that separation and re returning back to him, doing a 180 in our life and returning back to him. Him. And um, so here he is repenting now by coming home and saying, God, Dad, I want to have you in my life. I'm sorry, and I, I missed you, and I want to be with you again. And uh, the father just welcomes him with open arms. And uh, he says, the father says, um, now the son of mine was dead and is now alive again. And I remember I felt dead in my sin. I felt so empty inside. I felt like I was dead. And when I came home uh, to be with God, I... Um, I felt full of life, and uh, he gives life, and life to the full. He wants to give life to the full measure, and uh, he can and will if you allow him in your life. And um, 
There's also a parable of the, a parable of the lost sheep, and that's a great one. We're not going to get into today, but basically, the parable of the lost sheep says that the that the, the the basically that the heavens are singing and and the angels are singing and praising and God is celebrating over one lost sheep who's returned to Him, rather than even more so than 99 righteous sheep who are in His presence. That one lost sheep. He celebrates and runs after and brings home, and um, it just grieves him if even one is missing. Anyway, so the the love of the Father is so great we can't even imagine the mercies and the compassion that God has for us, and this is demonstrated so vividly in this story. Then we have the love of the uh, or the relationship with the older brother, the older son. Now this is the son that did everything right. This is a son that um, did not squander his father's inheritance. He did not squander his father's, uh, the responsibility that goes along with being the oldest son in that culture. The oldest son is the heir. The oldest son is going to receive everything and carry on the legacy of the family, the family tradition. It was very taken very seriously, and this older son obviously honored that, and that's to be commended. He absolutely did the right things. He stood by his father. He worked. He um, did not shame the family name. He did everything right. How many of you have felt like you do everything right? How many of you have felt like... Um, um, Josh Garnett, <laughs> I deserve this because I've done everything right. And how many of you have judged others who you view are not doing everything right and maybe look down your nose at someone because um, they're the sinners? because they're the ones who are squandering uh, what God wants to bless them with. They're living in sin. They're in the pig trough. They're eating with pigs. They're rolling with pigs. Um, maybe you've been the one who's judgmental, like this brother who says... Um, the older brother became angry, and he says, um, I've done everything right. Look, after all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. How many of you felt that sense of self-righteousness? How many of you have felt um, that it's okay to judge others because you've done everything right and they're doing everything wrong? I think that we have that in us, that judgmental quality. I think all of us have that judgmental um, potential within us. And uh, that's just as wrong as the son who ran off and, um, and, and squandered everything. In God's eyes, we have no right to judge. God is the judger, not us. And um, I think that, that that son, I felt that way. I remember recently... Um, God really showed this to me that I was being like the older brother recently. There was a situation in my life where a fellow believer was making some wrong choices and really sinning and um, not living in my mind according to God's will. And I found myself in my mind judging this person. And um, I found myself kind of sizing up their sin and saying, wow, they should know better. Um, I would never do anything like that. And God really convicted me. It was like the next day I was reading in scripture and he really convicted me. It was actually the scripture from Romans that says, um, you know, while we were still sinning, God died, Jesus died for our sins. And um, the Holy Spirit shared with me at that point that really, <laughs> I, here I am judging this person and um, that's what Jesus died for. That's what we have a Savior for, is for that redemption and that grace. Now, I'm not saying that we should just go on and sin because we have God's grace. That would make God's grace cheap. I'm saying that we should strive, like I said earlier in the show, strive to be in God's will and strive to please Him and strive to obey Him. But if we don't, because we are going to stumble because we're human, God's grace will lift us up. It's not our own performance that lifts us up. So I just think it's really amazing... Um, I think that both brothers here are really um, kind of exemplify people. And um, there's a, some life application in this Bible, the NIV Bible that I'm reading. And we're talking about um, specifically kind of breaking down the story and talking about how our recovery or our, restu our restoration to God is demonstrated in the story. And it says that... Um, Recovery is precisely that, a return based on repentance. So whether you're the judgmental brother or the son who runs off, the brother who runs off and squanders everything and lives in sin, either case, um, we need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness and return to him through obeying him. Until we surrender our life completely to God's care, we're moving further and further away from him with every step. This is a journey 
base that also says in Isaiah 53, 6, describes as going our own way like a lost sheep. Recovery begins when face down in our own personal pig trough, we, real, we realize that apart from God, our life is a disaster. Repentance is the beginning of our journey back to the arms of our loving Father. So just know that God is the loving Father and He's waiting for you to repent. He's waiting for you to return to Him so that you can live with Him in glory. And the way back to God is through Jesus Christ. And I love that because we can have a personal relationship with a Savior who died for us. With a Savior who, while we were still sinning, while we were still making the poor choices, while we were still hurting other people, while we were still hurting ourselves, while we were still living in disobedience, while we were still uh, idolizing other gods, while we were still pursuing money and greed and our own gain, all of those things that we do today, that God died for us, that Jesus died for us. And um, we have that hope in Him, our Savior, who is just waiting for the relationship with us that will change our life and um, that we can share that with other people. So when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about this, and then I want to read a devotion for the day. And um, do stay tuned to Love, Hope, and Faith. We'll, we'll be right back in three minutes. You're watching your local television network, TSPN, and now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Welcome back to the last segment of Love, of Love, Hope, and Faith, and I uh, hope you've been getting something out of today's um, episode, out of today's show, because um, I've been sharing from the Bible about the prodigal son and uh, the two brothers, one who squandered um, the family inheritance and brought shame to the family, family name, and the other one who um, was self-righteous and did everything right. Both of them represent people, and uh, the father in the story represents God and his amazing love and how he redeems, how he is the redeemer and how he forgives without question and he for remembers our sin no more and um, all of us fall short of the glory of God and God does not expect us to be perfect he does expect us to strive for his will and he does um, through the power of the Holy Spirit we can do that through God helping us to be more like him but um, we're gonna stumble we're gonna fall we're gonna falter we're gonna make mistakes and we have the redemption of the Savior we have Jesus Christ who can restore us and who wants to help us and who who um, he died for our sins and uh, so we don't want to cheapen that grace and when I say cheap grace I mean someone who says well I'll just do what I want because God will forgive me we don't want to live like that and that's certainly not what God um, is describing in this story that's certainly not what we should take away from the story we what we should realize is that God's grace is is um, without limits but it also is um, the obedience is also a huge part of being in relationship with him because just like any relationship relationships have boundaries and relationships have expectation and relationships have um, you know things in a relationship with the person whether it be your family member or friends or your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend there's the give and take there's there's expectations of commitment within that relationship and same thing with our relationship with God there's an expectation of commitment and and God does expect that from us um, but also, when we fall, he's there to pick us up without question. He just loves us, and he's not going to he's not going to um, he's not going to kick you in the butt. He's not going to he's not going to shame you or criticize you. He's just going to love you and forgive you and help you to do better the next time. And um, like I said before, no matter where you've been, there's hope. You're not too far gone for God's love. And it doesn't matter how many times you've fallen off the wagon. Maybe you're on a journey of recovery. Maybe you relapsed, and um, you you don't think that um, God's going to forgive you you just one more time but you're wrong he will forgive you seven times 700 seven times 70 seven times whatever he will forgive you as many times as it takes to get you back in a good walk with him and um and I just love that no person can offer that only God can offer that and uh you know, many of you know I've shared before. I'm a, I'm the ministry leader of our Celebrate Recovery program at the Church of the Nazarene. The Church of the Nazarene is my home church, and it's an awesome church. If you don't have one here in Elmore County, do check us out. We love new people to come and 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 um, celebrate with us the stories of God. And um, I have a great church family, and uh, we have a great pastor, Mark Lehman. He just delivers a wonderful message. Definitely, definitely. Um, 
has the Holy Spirit in him and he's passionate about living a life in Christ and we have services at 8.30 on Sunday mornings and also at 11 a.m. and we have our Sunday school classes at 9.45 a.m. We have a variety of different types of Sunday school classes. We also have our Wednesday night, Wednesday night ministry. Right now we're doing uh, teaching guardrails which is a Bible study by Andy Stanley about how to live with guardrails so we don't get tempted to, die, to fall off the edge into sin and it's a great, um, a great video study, great uh, Bible study. We have our men's ministry, our women's ministry. We have Joy Ministries. Joy stands for Just Over Youth. I love that acronym. So it's our seniors who, who do ministry together and uh, have fellowship together. We have our Celebrate Recovery, which meets on Friday nights at, at uh, 6.15, 5.30 for dinner on the fourth Friday of every, of every month. Um, come and join us at Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery, you may think it's for people with addiction issues. And it is. It is for people that struggle with uh, food addictions, alcohol addictions addictions, drug addictions, but it's also pe for people with habits, hurts, and hang-ups. So what that means is for people with hurts. So I always say Celebrate Recovery is for everybody. I'm in the program myself, I'm the leader of the program, um, but I joined the program a few years ago because of the hurts I had from past experiences, from childhood issues, and my sister, many of you know she was killed by a drunk driver in 1994, and I carried a lot of anger and lack of forgiveness and shame and guilt because of that accident. I had nothing to do with the accident, but um, it still affected me in a very dramatic way. And um, so I was carrying around a lot of baggage and many of us do. We carry baggage around and that affects all of our relationships and we can't be whole. We can't be at peace. And I found through the Celebrate Recovery program, which is a Christ-centered 12-step program, that I've been able to sort through all that baggage and let it go. To let go and let God and let His healing power into my life. And so I cannot say enough good about the Celebrate Recovery. Do check us out. Um, as every Friday night. We also have our children's ministry at the Church of the Nazarene. It's just an awesome, awesome children's ministry. Um, lots of, for every age group, we have our, um, we, we do Wednesday night ministry for the kids and the youth, which is a junior high and the senior high also. And um, just a wonderful children's pastor, Darlene Franks, and uh, just a great staff, great worship. Have I, have I sold it enough? <laughs> we have a great church I love so much, and they are a huge supporter of the show, and I really thank the Church of the Nazarene. So anyway, going back to recovery, and uh, this story, the, the, uh, the, the story of the prodigal son, really is about recovery in my mind. Because until we can repent and return to God, we're not going to be able to recover in our lives, recover from whatever it is that's hurting us. So I really encourage you really, really encourage you to come back to God, or if you have never had a relationship with Him, seek Him out. Just let Him know that you want Him in your life, and He, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that He will begin to make Himself known to you in ways that you never imagined. And I'm not talking about um, the God of, of um, judgment and the God of, um, of um, may the God that you have, have maybe mistakenly thought of, the God that, uh, that you have to be perfect for, because you don't. Just come as you are, and He will meet you where you are, and He'll clean you up, and He'll make you whole, and He'll love you, and He'll give you joy. And um, today is, uh, I, as you know, I always read the devotional, too, from Jesus Calling. It's my favorite devotional by Sarah Young. There's so many great devotionals out there. But I wanted to read today's devotional as we kind of tie up the lesson. And um, today, June 19th, the devotional is... I am the foundation on which you can dance and sing and celebrate. And I love that because I was so pleased to read this devotional today and see how beautifully it tied in with the story. Because if you remember, the father in this story, he dances and celebrates and sings for joy when his son, who's been gone, returns to him. And so I love that. So God is the God of singing and dancing and celebrating. And I love to envision God singing in heaven. It says all over the Psalms, if you've ever read the Psalms, it talks a lot about God singing over us. And just imagine right now, no matter where you are, that God is singing over you. And He is so delighted the moment you think of Him. And the moment you give Him any glory, He is so excited and He's so delighted in you. He delights in you and He invites you to delight in Him. I am the firm foundation on which you can dance and sing and celebrate my presence. This is my high and holy calling for you. Receive it as a precious gift. God is a gift to you. 
Glorifying and enjoying me is a higher priority than maintaining a tidy, structured life. Okay, next time I want to clean the house, I'm going to say nope because God wants me to sing and celebrate instead. <laughs> I love that. So let me repeat that. This is my high and holy calling for you. Receive it as a precious gift. Glorifying and enjoying me is a higher priority than maintaining a tidy, structured life. God created joy. God created laughter in us, and he wants us to celebrate. Give up your striving. Give up your striving to keep everything under control, an impossible task and a waste of precious energy. Control really is, a, is the perception of control. We really don't have control. Control is a lie. Um, we have control over some things. We have control over our choices, absolutely. But we don't have really control over anything else, do we? We don't have control over our kids or our husbands or our wives. We don't have control over our job. Anything could happen. Imagine driving down the freeway or any road here in Amador County at 55, 60 miles an hour, and you're passing other cars going on the opposite direction. Do you think you really have control? At any moment, someone could, I'm not trying to scare you, but at any moment, someone could look down to change the radio station, or they could look over at a passing airplane, or they could get, turn around and yell at their kids in the car, and they could run right into you. Do you really think you have control? It's only by God's grace that every day you make it to where you got to go safely. That's just one, one example. God's grace and his plan for you, okay? So we really don't have control. So we need to stop striving for control and let God have control of our lives. And there is freedom in that, and there is relief in that, and there is hope in that, and there is joy in that. There is freedom in that. My guidance for each of my children is unique. In other words, God does not, he has a different plan for each one of us. Don't compare yourselves to other people. Don't um, judge uh, self-righteously other people's walk because God wants us to focus on our own walk with him, our own relationship with him. Each of us is unique and each of the, of the, of the life's plan is unique. That's why listening to me is so vital for your well-being. Do you listen to God? Or do you do most of the talking? I really encourage you and invite you to meditate on God's word. The word meditate doesn't really mean anything other than listening for his voice. Sitting in silence, listening for God's voice. He is speaking to you. Do you listen to Jesus? One of the ways that I help myself in my listening skills with God is I, every morning, I have my quiet time. I get up about 5.15 in the morning, and I have about 45 minutes of just me and Jesus time. And I, I love it. I cannot imagine starting my day any other way. It's like where I put on my armor. It's where I get my hope. It's where I get filled up for the day. And um, I just love it so much. But what I do, what I've learned, we had a, Hal Perkins is, a, is an amazing um, teacher about God. He's a pastor within the Nazarene Church and an author, and he's written a lot of books. But he came to our church and taught us about how to have conversation, dialogue with God. Not just giving a list of all the things that we want God to do for us, but actually how to be in his presence and listen to him. And so what I've done is I set up a chair at my, at my kitchen table where I actually, where Jesus sits. Okay, don't think I'm crazy. Okay, but he sits and we have conversation. And um, he, he talks to me. And, I, and, and he, he talks to you. He wants to talk to you. Um... Let me prepare you for the day that awaits you and point you in the right direction. I am with you continually, so don't be intimidated by fear. Fear is the absence of faith. Another acronym for fear is false evidence appearing real. F-E-A-R. And fear is of the enemy, and fear is based on our own desire to control And we, when we feel like we're out of control. Fear, don't let that intimidate you. Because God is in control, and God has the plan, and God um, is with you. And uh, you've got to have faith. Though it stalks you, fear that is, it cannot harm you as long as you cling to my hand. Keep your eyes on me, enjoying peace in my presence. Jesus is peace. And this world is not peace, but Jesus is peace. And when you put your hope in him and focus on him and uh, let him hold your hand, just like the, the parent who holds the child's hand as the child crosses the street, that's the kind of security and safety that we have in Jesus. And he is holding our hand as we cross this busy life. And uh, he, he is peace. Just fall into his arms. Believe in him. Trust in him. He will change your life. And um, I pray that you have a great week, and I'll see you next week. I have a great show lined up, and I can't wait to see you next week. So stay tuned.